Hello, and welcome back to the Dante in a Year podcast. My name is Danny Fitzpatrick. Today, we continue with Dante's Purgatorio, Canto 30. When the northerly star of the first heaven, which neither ever falls nor springs up, nor was veiled of any cloud but guilt, and which made each one of them aware of its duty, as the lowest made those watchful turn toward the port, when they had fixed themselves firm, the true people came, come first between it and the griffin, turn to the chariot as to their peace. And one of them, as a messenger from heaven, called out three times, chanting, Veni, sponsa de Libano, and all the others chanted after. As the blessed at the last blast will each rise ready from his cavern, the voices dressed again, singing Alleluia. So upon the divine chariot rose a hundred, ad vocem tante senis, ministers and messengers of eternal life. All said, Benedicti qui venis, and casting flowers overhead and all around, Manibus o date lilia plenis. I see now in the commencement of the day the Orient's element all reddened, and the other skies adorned of serene beauty and the face of the sun born shadowed, so that through the temperance of vapors the eye could sustain it the longer. So within a cloud of flowers which was soaring from angelic hands and descending again within and without it, bound in olive over a white veil, a lady appeared to me below a green mantle vested in the color of vivid flame. And my spirit, which now had stood so long a time freed of that stupor which had overcome me, trembling at her presence, without the deeper recognition of the eyes, by the secret strength that moved from her, I sensed the great power of the ancient love. Once that lofty power which already had transfixed me before I was beyond my boyhood burst upon my vision, I turned myself to the left, with the security with which the little one runs to his mamma when he fears or is afflicted, to say to Virgil, less than a dram of blood remains to me that doesn't tremble, I recognize the sign of the ancient flame. But Virgil had left us lessened of himself, Virgil the sweetest father, Virgil to whom I handed myself for my salvation, and not as much as the ancient mother lost would avail that my cheeks cleansed by dew would not be darkened again with weeping dante though virgil has gone his way still do not weep do not weep yet for you must yet weep by another sword as the admiral who comes to poop and prow to see the men who minister to the other barks and encourage them to do well so on the left hand of the chariot, when I turned to the sound of my name, which of necessity is registered here, I saw the lady who'd first appeared to me, veiled below the angelic festival, direct her eyes upon me from across the river. For all of the veil which descended from her head and circled with the fronds of Minerva did not let her appear fully manifest, regally, still scornful in aspect, she continued as the one who speaks and holds his hottest words in reserve. Look, truly I am, I am truly Beatrice. How were you granted access to the mountain? Don't you know that here man is happy? My eyes fell upon the clear font, but seeing myself within it, I drew them back to the grass, such shame engraved my brow. As the mother seems overbearing to her son, so she seemed to me, for the savor of pity, bitter pity tastes harsh. She was silent, and the angels immediately chanted, In te domine speravi, but did not pass beyond pedes meos. Just as the snow congeals among the vivid beams down the spine of Italy, blown and beaten by the Slavonian winds, then made liquid leaks upon itself. If only the land that's lost its shadow should breathe, so that it seems a flame to melt a candle. So was I, without tears and sighs, before the singing of those who ever take their notes from those of the eternal gyres. But once I'd understood their compassion for me and their sweet timbre, it seemed as if they'd said, Lady, why do you so torment him? The chill that had constricted about my heart split into spirit and water, and with anguish issued from my breast at the mouth and the eyes. She, still standing firm upon that flank of the chariot, thus then turned her words to the pitying substances. You hold vigil in the eternal day, such that neither night nor sleep can steal a step from you of those the ages take along their way. 
so that my response comes with deeper care, that he who weeps there understand me, so his guilt and grief might be of one measure. Not only in the labor of the great wheels, which direct each seed to a single end according to the stars that accompany them, but by the largesse of divine grace, which draws its rain from such lofty vapors that our vision can't come close to them. This man was such in his new life, in respect to virtue, that every proper habit would have proved marvelous in him. But so much wilder and more malignant does terrain uncultivated and set with evil seed become the more vigorous the good soil there. Some time I sustained him with my visage, showing my youthful eyes to him. I turned him and led him with me on the right path. As soon as I was on the threshold of my second age and changed my life, this one took himself from me and gave himself to others. When I had ascended from flesh to spirit, as beauty and virtue swelled in me, I was less dear to him and less welcome. And he turned his steps down a false way, following false images of the good, which render back no promises fulfilled. Nor would the inspiration I begged for him have availed me, when with these means and in dreams and otherwise I called him. So little did he listen. So far did he fall that all arguments for his salvation were now too short, other than to show him the people in perdition. For this I visited the entrance of the dead, and weeping, bore my prayers to him who has conducted him here above. God's high fate would be broken, if leth were passed, and its living draft enjoyed without such a penalty of repentance as he expends in tears. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Dante in a Year podcast. See you next time for Dante's Purgatorio, Canto 31.